I wasn't afraid to, or I was afraid to deal with him. It was that he couldn't be dealt with. Like he literally didn't like, you know, it it only exacerbated and made things worse. If I tried to be calm and reason with him. (laughs) You're listening to the Nacho Kids podcast, where we discuss all things step family related, real stories, real people, real help. Your hosts are the creators of the Nacho Kids Method and the Nacho Kids Academy Step Family Coaching Team, Lori and David Sims. Welcome one and welcome all to the Nacho Kids Podcast. You are in the right place. Maybe. If you are happy in your blend and there's butterflies and unicorns and rainbows all around you, you might not want to. You're still in, you you're might, still in the right no, place. No, no, you might not want to listen to this. No, you're still in the right place. There you go. <laughs> learn, learn, I mean, listen to this stuff, and you'll be more appreciative of your blend. Well, how many times have we heard people say, uh, "I didn't need any of that mess, and I didn't believe any of that mess," and until, <laughs> mm-hmm. exactly. Well, this is episode two hundred and eight, and David's not right. going to do that in Spanish for y'all. Nope. <laughs> and I want to talk a little bit before we start talking about our guest. I want to talk about what we hear versus what they say. (laughs) Okay. The longer David and I have been together and the older we get, it seems like we don't hear what the other one says a lot. Because you mumble. He says I mumble. (laughs) No, here's what she does, y'all. She will literally look the other direction and talk. I used to could do that and you could hear me. Like, Okay, so yesterday, perfect example. Oh, Yesterday. I'm I'm walking toward my uh, garage, which is a detached garage, and I see her on the deck of of the house, facing the pool, and which is we're talking fifty feet. So, you know, between me and her, there's other things, there's noises and all this, and so I'm like, "Hey, what are you doing?" She doesn't turn around. She doesn't, I just hear her, (laughs) and I'm just like, whatever. I just watch. (laughs) I have no earthly idea what she had to say. (laughs) It's all I heard. But there are times (laughs) that I will be looking at you, and I will say X, Y, Z. Then, 45 seconds later, you say X, Y, Z like it's the first time you've heard it. Maybe you're trying to implant stuff in my head. It's what you're trying to do, subliminal messaging. So we all need to work on that. And the other thing that she does. Oh, gosh. I didn't know this was going to be a bash Lori day. I'm in a good mood today, David. Don't do this. (laughs) So. Button pusher, button pusher. I come come down yesterday and, um, no, it was was Sunday, I believe. So she wants me to, to help get supper ready, which I'm happy to do. And. Like five minutes before I'm coming down to help do supper, I have a client that's got this big issue and, you know, things are on fire. I'm in IT. Everybody needs something immediately and the whole world's burning down. So I'm messaging back and forth between the client who has their hair on fire, my uh, engineers who are trying to help said person with hair on fire, and Lori's talking to me. Well, um, I don't know about most folks. For me, when I am engaged in something, everything else is completely blocked out because I am hyper focused. There's no such thing as multitasking, hyper focused on what's going on. And and so she says, Did you put bacon on that? And I'm like, I didn't know I was in charge of putting bacon on that. She goes, I just told you. And I'm like, I'm in the middle of a crisis over here doing something different. And you're mad at me because I didn't hear you say, you're in charge of bacon. <laughs> I wasn't mad at you. You had cooked the bacon. Right. Sat it at the end of the table. Mm-hmm. I'm doing everything else. Mm-hmm. And you're on your phone. Crisis. Crisis. The thing is, if you can't do what you said you were going to help do, then just say it. Just say, I'm in a crisis right now. Because honestly, David, I know our listeners are loving this, but honestly, <laughs> David... You're on your phone a lot. I don't know if it's work related or it's always work related. Bull crap. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And so <laughs> I don't know if it's work related or if you're just chatting with somebody or what's going on. Because most of the time when I do talk to you, your face is in the phone. Because I'm working. You know, I don't scroll social media. Yes, you do. You send me all kind of crazy stuff. That's not social media. I send you news articles. You do scroll social media because you're like, why is this thing starting and playing without me telling it to you? I can't stand it. That's because I'm I'm scrolling looking at people selling stuff and it has ads that pop up. <laughs> so anyway, people. <laughs> So, the moral of the story is... David is not a good listener. Lori's not a good communicator. Oh, we want to go down this path. <laughs> Y'all, I have proof that it runs <laughs> into Sims family, that they are poor communicators. Thank you. Thank you for giving me an out. It is a problem it starts that I with not control. <laughs> no, it does Because your kids are horrible communicators. It goes back to my great-great-grandfather. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway. No, I'm, no, we're not horrible communicators. And you're not a horrible communicator. But there are times when we are not focused on communication. Whether it's, I've got my head in a phone, face in a phone, whatever. Or whether it's that you're turning the opposite direction where nobody can hear you but the trees. We need to be more intentional about being better communicators. <laughs> exactly. And I did a podcast about active listening a while back. I think it was a while back. Might be in the future. Don't know. But it's really hard to be an active listener. It's something mm -hmm. you have to practice. Yeah. It's hard to even have a communi uh, conversation in the same room around here. What you saying, David? Nothing. But, I mean, I, I know I've heard Jackson say before, like, I can't hear you. I say that you to know. him. It, what's funny is he'll <laughs> holler at me from his bedroom, and that's acceptable. But if I, I holler at him and he's in his bedroom, that's unacceptable. He's like, why can't you come here and ask me that? <laughs> and that's like you. I hear y'all. I hear y'all. Don't think this the, the problem with communication is just between me and you. I hear you and your son doing the same things. <laughs> no, that's because he don't listen. <laughs> it's a male thing, people. It's a male thing. Oh, so we just jumped from my family over to your son. Well, no, it oh, was a God. realization because you and your boys, all boys, my son, all boys, your mother oh, talks boys. about your father not she listening. She don't listen either. She don't listen either. So there you go. It's a man thing. It's not. It's a everybody thing, honestly. <laughs> No. It is. No. Yeah, oh, no, no, it is. No. Trust me. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, our guest today. <laughs> if you're still listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like, I ain't listening to y'all's crap. Oh, they love it. <laughs> <laughs> Bull crap, David. Bull crap. Okay. Whatever, Lori. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know that's a trigger. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Zero. And we're back. And we're back. Okay. <laughs> Our guest today is Kim Minch. She is a certified parent coach, and she is the bio mom of the blend. She's been married now for 30 plus years. Hmm. I've been married that long. David. What? Well, on and off. No, you haven't. <laughs> you sure? I'm positive. I don't know. It feels like that. Because when we made it to year 12, you're like, you beat her. You beat her. Like, I cared. But, I mean, we're not even, we're close to year 14. And you were married to her 11. That's 25. No, no, 12. 26. Okay. God, I still feel like 30 years. She is now experiencing empty nesting. Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a whole different thing. You haven't even gone through that yet. You just wait. She helps parents have better relationships with teenage and adult kids. What about adult stepmoms? <laughs> You're just trying to think of something. <laughs> what about a better relationship with my adult wife who don't listen? <clears throat> <laughs> listen, Linda. We talk about the family court system. <laughs> I must add. That this episode includes mention of addiction to alcohol. 
She says she tried to co-parent with her ex-husband, but he was narcissistic, drunk, and only wanted to lower his child support. Uh, That's problematic. Sound familiar to anybody else out there? (laughs) Probably a lot of folks. She said the kids never really felt at home at either home. Mm, Yeah. We had that problem when the you know, when our custody schedule had them moving around so much, you know, they felt the same way. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about how when something happens and you don't want to believe that it's your son. (laughs) Yeah. Like every time. (laughs) No. And we don't want to believe that either our spouse or our kids lying. So it puts you you in a predicament. Mm-hmm. Treat them like you treat your kids. You're like, oh, y'all lying. That's what my, my mom would do. she punish all yeah. of us. Get in here. I'm going to spank every one of you. My mom must <laughs> say, y'all won't tell me the truth, y'all. Oh, on restriction. Don, you on restriction for a week. Courtney, you on restriction for two days. And Lori, you on restriction for a month. I'm like, well, what happened here? She knew. She knew you how you were. It wasn't me. It was Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> my mom would spank both of us, me and my sister. And I would be like, why are you spanking me? And she goes, because I'm sure I'll get the right one if I do that. <laughs> <laughs> we also talk about transition days. And it's very important that we discuss transition days. It's hard on everybody. Mm-hmm. Just the lead up to transition days. Yep. All right. I'm not going to tell you anything else. All right, cool. Let's do that thing that you don't do well and get to listening. <laughs> <laughs> that sound you hear is me not showing David. <laughs> Today we have Kim Minch. She is from Real Life Parent Guide and she is the bio mom of her blend. Hey Kim, how are you? I'm great, Lori. Good to talk to you today. You too. Tell us a little bit about your blend. Well, I had my eldest son at the age of 18, and his dad and I stayed together for a couple of years. And then that didn't turn out to be the most healthy relationship. And I moved out of that. And about a year and a half later, I got married to my current husband of 30 some years, Tom. And so when my eldest son, Nick, was about three and a half, we got married. So The blended part is him being, you know, part of our lives as we started off our marriage. And then since that time, I have four other now mainly grown children in the mix. So total of five kids. Okay. So you have one kid Mm -hmm. that you brought into the relationship. Yes. And y'all had four kids together. Yes. Okay. Tell us boy, girl, boy, girl. And their uh, ages. Four boys and a girl. So at this point, my eldest son is 36, and, or he'll be 36 in a couple of months. And then I have a son that's 29, 25-year-old son, 20-year-old son, and my only daughter is going to be 18 very shortly. So there's almost 18 years between the two kids. Wow. The oldest and youngest, yeah. <laughs> so did you just have to keep trying to get that girl? You know, people would, I was done at five, whether I, whether it was a boy or a girl, but I had always wanted a girl. So obviously I was super jazzed to know that I was going to be able to have that at, you know, and, and actually it's been interesting, obviously after four boys to be mothering a girl is, can be sometimes, you know, very different than the boys. And it definitely keeps me on my toes. And I definitely wasn't the same mom at 18 with my first son that I was when I had my fifth and daughter at 36. Oh, I can definitely see that. Yeah. (laughs) It, It changes every time, doesn't it? It does. You're like a different, you know, you're obviously, I think as time goes on, you're usually less anxious. And I definitely know that by the time my daughter was born, she was for sure very portable. She went between, you know, three different brothers, baseball games at all times. There was no like routine for the poor girl. She, you know, just went along. (laughs) What's her relationship like with your oldest bio son, considering Um, that they're 18 years apart? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would say, you know, we encouraged, well, my, my oldest son obviously has been out of the house for a long time. But when we were all under the same roof together, they had a very good relationship. We, of course, wanted him to feel a part of all of the kids' lives, of course. 
But for her, she she, um, was his godchild when she was baptized and, you know, just tried to create an, an additional bond that way with them. Now it is with the kids and the ages that they are. And I say kids loosely because obviously they're all taller than me and it's hard to call them kids, but <laughs> they, did come, they did come through me. So I, so I do call them kids, you know, they're all going in many different directions at this point. And really when we are together, which is, you know, a couple times a year, they are very, they get along very well. They have very diverse beliefs and career paths and lives, but definitely my oldest and youngest can relate on different things like computer and music. And they, they go out of their way to make sure that everyone feels, you know, included and whatnot. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. So you said you've been married. How long? Uh, It'll be 31 years in May. Oh, congratulations. Yes. (laughs) It's a long time. And we're, I just um, actually was filming a video because I'm empty nesting. So my daughter, you know, the youngest is a senior in high school and will be going to college somewhere next year, not at not being at home. And so it's, it's kind of the first time in our lives that, you know, I, I mean, I've been a mom with a kid around since I was 18 years old. So it's, it's, it's going to be interesting. (laughs) Has she moved out yet? She's not. She's finishing her senior year. Yeah. Oh, I can't imagine the emotions you're going through. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm trying to look at it as being excited. And the job that I do that I just started in the last couple of years is coaching other parents. And so I'm very invested. And I feel like it came about in my life at the perfect time that I could really sink my teeth into it. And I absolutely have a passion for helping parents have healthier relationships with their teens and young adults. So I'm really invested in this new chapter of my life being about not working, you know, in terms of raising kids, but helping other families. Yes. And that's why we do what we do. Mm. So how old was your son when you and your husband met? He was, let's see, he got married. We got married when he was just about four. So great. He was three years old. Did he go back and forth and visit with his dad? Yes. And it's kind of an interesting story there. Yes. So like I said, his dad and I, dad was 19. I was 18 when we had him and we stayed together for a couple of years, but it was a very um, emotionally abusive and then became physically abusive. So at that point, I decided that I wanted out of the relationship. And of course, we still had to co-parent. So my son, you know, definitely went between two very different circumstances. And shortly thereafter, I then got married. So from the time my son was three until he was 18, he, you know, went back and forth. We lived close to his dad, but, you know, we we, we went through a lot. We went through some court issues and challenges, and it was not always smooth sailing. I'll say that for sure. When... You said that he went back and forth. Was it kind of like 50-50 or? It was, um, let me see, 34.6% of the time he was with dad, if I remember correctly. What? Yeah. <laughs> 34.6% Yeah, I'm not dad. sure where that came from, but that's that's what I remember the court, you know, being. It was a, like a Thursday through Sunday, kind of not every weekend, but every other weekend. I, it was, and then a day in between or something yeah, like that. Yeah. And as he got to be a teenager and certainly driving, I think that he chose to be with his dad less and less. Although... He didn't like some of the rules at our house. So when he didn't like the rules and wanted fewer rules, he would spend more time at dad's house. If that makes sense. <laughs> oh, yeah, that makes sense. Wouldn't you? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I would. I would, too, as a teenager. But ultimately, you know, I think he ultimately realized several years later that it wasn't necessarily, a you know, best for him when he was in a place where there were really not a lot of rules for sure. Right. So does he, um, well, I want to go back to the court system. If you remember the court system, which I'm sure you do because it's fairly traumatic for most people. Yeah, Yeah, I do remember it. Yeah. Tell us about your, what you experienced with the court system. Why did you go to court? Some of the that happened, (laughs) how long you were in the court system kind of thing. 
Yeah. Okay. So a couple of times I had to go through the court system. First, when my son was born, I gave him my last name. Just, I don't know. I didn't, I, I didn't know if I'd ever marry his dad. And I, I just, we didn't give him his dad's name. When his dad and I broke up, part of my, I don't know, I don't want to say deal, but part of my giving to his dad was that we go through the court system to change my son's last name to his name. So I went through the court system at that point, and that was pretty smooth sailing to change his last name. He was, you know, a couple of years old and it just wasn't a big deal. But my husband, so many years later, my husband took a job out of state. We moved from Wisconsin to California and his dad We definitely had to go through the court system when that took place, and it was a nightmare. So talk about emotions. First, we tried to go through mediation. His dad was very unhappy that I was taking him out of state, and I felt as, you know, married and my husband was the provider that, you know, this was a job he was taking. We really had no, I really didn't have a choice, obviously, but to move out of state and trying to navigate my son's father's anger about the situation and my husband's excitement for a new job was interesting to say the least. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then really we tried to sit down and to mediate his dad and I. We really I I I had every intention of wanting I knew that we were the ones that were moving and I wanted to do what I could to make it as smooth as possible. This was plane ride, you know, that he was going to, my son was going to have to take by himself. He was nine years old, I believe when we moved. So, you know, I I knew that it was going to be stressful on my son as well. We could not work it out in mediation. So we ended up before the judge and I clearly remember going into the courtroom that day and just feeling like nobody was going to win here. And I would say, So the judge decided how we were going to split things up and who was going to pay for plane tickets. And his dad didn't necessarily win. I didn't necessarily win. But for certain, Nick was the biggest loser on the whole portion of it. I mean, he just and then and then what I realized is that the judge, my experience is that they don't really know you. They don't really care. They're just making a determination and moving on. And I I just, I, I remember feeling really not great about that. I can't Im- imagine because you're dealing with something different. Your kid's going to have to fly and all that stuff. How did they end up splitting time? Because he's in school, right? Yeah, every, like the holidays were like one year he would leave be- right before the holidays, like as soon as his school got out like that day and be gone for Christmas and New Year's. And then the following year, um, he could stay with us through Christmas Day and then had to go and visit his dad after that. And here's the thing, my son, I, I when I think back on it, I feel terrible. And simply because he would get off the plane and he would throw up because he was so nervous about flying by himself. And I just felt horrible, horrible about him being in that circumstance. And the other thing was, and I don't want to necessarily dog on his dad, and that's not my intention here, but in part, his dad's motivation, I believe, was to have as many overnights as possible to pay as little child support as possible to me because he really didn't like that I had gotten married and kind of moved on with my life. Sounds familiar. (laughs) Sounds familiar. How -hmm. did you adjust putting your son on that plane? Because I know that was not easy. No, it wasn't. As a matter of fact, one time when I was driving to San Francisco airport, I ended up getting him to the plane. I ended up colliding with a semi truck and just I, I, my anxiety level was so high Mm. that I ended up having an accident on the way to, to the airport. You know, fortunately, we actually only lived in California for two years. And I know part of the reason we moved back was when there was an opportunity for my husband to climb the corporate ladder again, the the opportunity came up in Wisconsin. And I immediately was like, yes, we need to go home because that's, that's where, you know, we had been raised and where my son's father was. And it was like, we got to go home. 
like this, I, I, I can't do this mm -hmm. <laughs> anymore. So fortunately that turned out. So two years later, we again went through the court system. It wasn't nearly as traumatic that time. We managed to come to an agreement that didn't always make sense. Again, his, I, and I, I don't, you know, his dad was really motivated by, ha he didn't necessarily want to be a hands-on father, mm -hmm. but he really did not want to pay me child support. So anything he could do, even if it made his life inconvenient, he would do that in order so that I, he would have more time with our son. Okay. Just to lower the child support. Yeah. Yeah. He, he really, uh, and I, I say this, I, I need to, I guess I'm going to say at this point, his dad passed away when my son was 21 and my son went through an addiction to alcohol, which uh -huh. complicated matters towards the end of he, my son ended up moving out of our house on his 18th birthday because we confronted him once again about taking alcohol from our cupboard. And he just said, I'm out of here. I'm going to go live with my dad because there's no rules there. Well, that turned out to be a really bad thing for my son, obviously, but and it exacerbated his coping skill of using alcohol. So that was another thing that we went through. I also had to walk through my son's active addiction while co-parenting with a man who was very addicted to alcohol and again um, ended up drinking himself to death at the age of 42. Oh, so it was challenging to parent with and this this had been going on for many years, right? I I had to work hard to co-parent with him and try and reason with him at times, you know, during my son's like teenage years and things that were going on there in school and whatnot, reasoning with him when he wasn't fully there mm -hmm. also made it challenging. So co-parenting with someone who is, has narcissistic tendencies and drinks heavily was, was, a, was a challenge, put it that way. <laughs> so it's very difficult to parent or co-parent with an ex that has all these issues and is narcissistic and is just trying to keep his child support the lowest he can and doesn't really care to spend time with the kid otherwise. Yes, it is. And I will tell you when I look back on it, yes, we had a more, um, I don't want to say stable, but a more traditional family with my husband and I and, you know, the four kids. He So Nick went between that situation and his dad did end up getting married, but they never had any children. And he was very, very clear and very vocal about never wanting to have any more children. And when I look back on it, I do believe that my son never felt fully accepted in either home. Mm -hmm. I, my, you know, I, I think it was very difficult for him. And as a mom in the situation, I know that my husband is very type A, very hard driven. And Nick, I think in part because of, you know, going back and forth and just his own personality wasn't quite so driven, wasn't very school minded. And it caused a rift between my husband and my son. And so trying to navigate those teen years when you know, and at one point, liquor was starting to disappear from our cabinet, also added another layer of challenge. It was very hard to be co-parenting with someone who's who's addicted to alcohol, has narcissistic traits, and, you know, then a husband uh, who also has a very, his very own ideas and opinions on how things should be going. So I, I felt very alone at times, for sure. For sure. And you can't co-parent with somebody like that. No, I, I really, to a minimum, I mean, once he got into high school, we would go to school conferences together and he always reeked of alcohol. And I always made it very clear to the teachers that we were talking to that we weren't married. And that just was, you know, it just, it was bad. It was bad. And that, and I really kept it to a minimum as much as possible the older he got. And, and it wasn't because 
I wasn't afraid to, or I was afraid to deal with him. It was that he couldn't be dealt with. Like right. he literally didn't like, you know, it, it only exacerbated and made things worse. If I tried to be calm and reason with him. <laughs> yes, I get it. I get it. What issues did your now husband and your oldest son have? My son was very loyal to his father. I didn't find out until years later when my son went into treatment that the abuse, the emotional and physical abuse that I had experienced with his dad before I left him was then transferred onto my son. And I didn't learn about that. I didn't know about that until my son went to treatment and started confiding in what had happened to him. I think the issues between my husband and my son were really because of personality differences and expectations that my husband had of how my son, you know, should do in school and be involved in sports and things. And my son just wasn't that maybe traditional boy type kid. Mm -hmm. He has wonderful strengths and talents, but school was not one of those things. And my husband was very driven on that. So that was something that, especially as middle school and high school progressed, really drove a wedge between the two of them. And then when the alcohol started going missing, that absolutely just irritated my husband. And when I, and when I think back on it, you know, I was always the one. So this will probably have make sense to your, some of your listeners as well. I, my husband would come to me and say, there's alcohol missing. Mm -hmm. And I had a good relationship with my son. I thought I did anyway. I, you know, he would come to me with friendship issues and girlfriend issues and whatnot. We talked like we had a good relationship. And when my husband started coming to me with this, you know, alcohol is missing deal. I was like, I thought that my husband was like making it up because it irritated him that I was as close as I was to my son. Obviously learned that that was not the case, that he was not lying about it. But it was me that confronted my son until, and this probably happened a couple of times before on his 18th birthday, my husband directly confronted my son. And they almost got into, you know, a physical altercation until my son just said, I'm out of here. I'm, I, I can't do this anymore. So. Wow. Those were the challenges that went on. How did you feel? Well, you said you didn't want to believe what your son was saying. I mean, your husband was saying. Yes. Like he's making it up. I did. I actually thought that he was jealous of the fact that Nick and I had a good rapport and relationship for some reason. I thought he was making it up. The bio parent feels they have to choose who's lying between the kid and their spouse or partner. Mm -hmm. and I too have been like, no, I don't think that he did that kind of thing. But I also notice in nuclear families, it happens because whether we like to say it or not or admit it, there are favorite children in nuclear families. Mm -hmm. So how did you feel when your husband would say, anything negative about your son? Very defensive. Yeah, I would I would get very defensive uh, immediately. And I think part when it comes to the alcohol, I think part of it was I, I didn't want to believe. I mean, there was a denial factor for sure. Right. And I didn't know how to deal with it. It was my first teenager. Uh, and I, I just really didn't know how to deal with it. So it was easier in some respects to say, he, you know, he's got to be lying. He's just jealous of the relationship I have with my son, which really is immature when I look back on it. And obviously the way things played out, I came to be, get very clear on the fact that my son had an alcohol issue. And like you said, that just adds to the layer of complexity. Mm-hmm. How did your other kids, did they know that he had an alcohol issue or they just all of a sudden, let's see, the oldest is how old? Seven years older? I mean, yeah, older than the next one. Um, yeah, there's like six six years apart. So that right, now, I mean, we're just are almost had birthdays for some of them, which is why it's. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so, how, yes, some of the other kids knew. 
So when my son went through this, when he went into treatment, he was 21. At the time, my husband and I, oldest son, was 15. And when my son went into treatment, he went in the southern part of Texas, six hours away from us. And we chose to bring our 15-year-old son with us to the treatment center for the family program weekend because, well, mainly because we he was old enough, we thought, for him to really understand. And then second, he was at an age where we wanted him to get educated on, you know, alcohol and whatnot. Let me just say that what happened when my son moved out, let's go back for a second, just because this isn't going to make sense. So okay. <laughs> when, my son, when my son moved out at 18 and moved into his dad's house, shortly thereafter, my husband again took a transfer to Texas. So we left Wisconsin again and moved to Texas. So my kids did not necessarily see Nick drinking because Nick was 1200 miles away. So okay. when I when I became very aware of Nick's drinking problem, I was trying to manage it 1200 miles away from home from him and also remain a present parent to the other four kids. So he was not right in our house at the time. Okay, that makes it a little easier. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. No, that makes much more sense. How did you feel you said that your son's father got remarried at some point? Mm -hmm. How did you feel about her, about him having a stepmom? Well, it was very strange, to be honest with you. His dad did not really let me ever have interactions with her. I don't know. Maybe that's not strange, but he really, his dad very much kept his wife away from any transaction that we had with Nick, you know, like going back and forth or whatever. And I had wanted to reach out to her at one point, just, you know, because I know that she was instrumental in his life. He was there, you know, a lot. And, but it just, it, it never, I, to be honest with you, I don't think I ever really talked directly with her maybe more than hello and, you know, just basic back and forth. She didn't seem to want to be a part of Nick's life. And that's why I say when I think back on Nick's childhood, you know, I think there were times when he didn't feel accepted in either place that he was in. Yeah. Which makes me sad, obviously. Oh, yeah. What made you think she didn't want to be a part of Nick's life? Is it because she wasn't talking to you or just other things? Well, Nick wouldn't, yeah, when Nick, when Nick would come home from being there, he wouldn't really mention that they did anything together or that she had much interaction with him. So I, I just, I got the feeling over the years that they didn't have a whole lot of interaction. Okay. Do you remember transition days when um, he, when Nick would go to his dad's? Or when you would get him back? Yes, there was always a period of time. I mean, we always, my husband and I would always be like, okay, the first couple of days are always an adjustment when Nick comes back. And by that, I mean, gosh, you know, he would be maybe more quiet and to himself and a little bit more irritable. There was just something every time he came back, it, it would take a day or two for him to readjust and and get kind of back to his normal personality. Yeah. And that's hard to watch him go through too. It is. It is. And when he was really little, I'll say he I don't know. I don't you may want to edit this out. I don't know. I'm going to tell you this story though cuz I think it's very it could be helpful. So, when my son was little and we first started going back and forth and having to trade off, my son went through a period of time when he really regressed with his potty training and would go many, many days without mm -hmm. going poop. And when I look back on that, I really think that he was going through a period of time where he knew he had no control over his life. He had to go to his dad's house on a certain day and have dinner with him, or it was a weekend visit. And he just, I, I think in part, he was trying to control another part of his life that 
he had no control over where he was going or who he was going to be with. And so I think in part, he decided to unconsciously, bodily try and hold control over himself. Yeah. Someone recently asked me if he would do a podcast with me about his addiction. And I don't know that he would go that public, but he certainly knows that. And, and you know, he wrote the foreword to my book. He's very behind me sharing how his addiction, you know, affected him and, and being a teen mom, how that affected me. So he's very behind me, but I don't know that he would be vocal. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. Yes. So tell us a little bit about what you do. I work with parents of 18 to 25 year olds who are looking to create happier, healthier relationships with their teens and young adults by working on themselves. So it's not so much strategy, although that is a part of it. It's really more parents working on their emotional well-being and sometimes processing their own childhood experience and hurts Mm -hmm. so that they can be more emotionally attuned to their teens and young adults. And I choose to work with this age group simply because I don't think there's enough support and encouragement for parents of older kids. And I think they need it. And because I jumped onto TikTok in 2021 and that's what hit coming at me. And I think it has to do with, of course, my personal story and the fact that my kids are older at this point. Yeah, girl, I cannot do TikTok. (laughs) I'm I'm trying. I don't like being on camera. I don't like pictures taken. I I just don't. And Mm. everybody's like, you got to get on TikTok. You got to show your face. I don't want to. Oh, but I know I, I have see, to. I enjoy video. Tomorrow, I'm actually speaking at the Adolescent Symposium in Dallas. I'm speaking in person, and I absolutely hate that. I mean, I am so anxious about it, but camera, I can do. <laughs> now, see, I would rather, I think, speak to a group than a camera, mm. Mm. but I don't like the public speaking either. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So much work to do, so much work to do. But if you ever see me on TikTok dancing, y'all, the world is coming <laughs> to an end. Just well, you'll never see me dancing on TikTok either, but that's that's where 99% of my business comes from TikTok. Really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's it's been such a blessing for me. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I know your oldest son's father has passed away. What was their relationship like prior to that? Well, I had gone up to Wisconsin to get my son to bring him into inpatient treatment because it was critical. I really felt that he would not last long in the world if he didn't get out of the situation that he was in and get some treatment. So I went and got him in Wisconsin, brought him down to Texas. And for several months after that, his dad tried to reach out to him on the phone And because of the physical and emotional abuse that my son suffered during his growing up years, every time he heard his dad's voice, it really would send him like reeling. So he never talked to his dad and he didn't realize how sick his dad was. And when his dad passed, it really threw my son into a major relapse. It really, it really threw my son into a major relapse when his dad died. He went to the funeral. He beat himself up for many months for not being there to help his dad or not, you know, for ignoring the phone calls and whatnot. But since that time, fortunately, with a lot of therapy and some sobriety, he is 13, almost 13 years sober at this point with that kind of emotional maturity and support that he's gotten through therapy, he understands that his, you know, his dad was very sick and he tries to concentrate on the times that they had that were good Mm -hmm. and, you know, just be realistic about who his dad was in his life. Yeah. And that's hard to do too. When you know that the kids saw stuff that they're probably thinking, man, I wish my dad wouldn't have blah, blah, blah. Mm Mm-hmm. Or I wish my mom wouldn't have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. 
So going through everything that you've gone through, what's the best advice you would give a bio mom that is getting ready to get into a blended type situation? Oh, that is such a good question. No one's ever asked me that question before. I would say, I, I say, educate yourself. Honestly, listen to podcasts like this, read books. I, I think I just didn't know what I didn't know. And I think when you educate yourselves on anything, anything related to our kids, but this in particular, to be able to have some frame of reference and some education behind blended families and kids going back and forth. And and it kind of, I don't want to say normalizes it, but you will be less anxious because you kind of know what to expect. And I think part of my issue was I didn't know anything about, you know, blending a family. And I was really relying on myself to figure it out. And I think there's a lot of good resources now. So don't be afraid to get help and don't be afraid to educate yourself. Exactly. Well, where can people find you? Uh, My website is reallifeparentguide.com. And I am on Instagram and TikTok. On TikTok, it's at Kim Minch Parent Coach. And on Instagram, it's Kim Minch Real Life Parent Guide. Spell Minch for us. M-U-E-N-C-H. It's not what you think, folks. It's (laughs) M-U-E-N-C-H. Well, thank you, Kim, for being a guest. We really appreciate you giving us your insight from a bio parent standpoint. Lori, it's been a great conversation. Thank you for having me. All right. Stay in touch. We are back. Oh, we are. We hope you enjoyed listening to our interview with Kim. We do have an announcement to make. Dave is going to be a granddaddy again. Oh, Lord. Yes, I am. One of the triplets in the Air Force in Germany let us know the other day that he is going to become a father. And and thank you for letting me know before you posted it on social media, son. I appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, because for those that don't know, you found out that your oldest got married via social media. Yeah. I'm like, (laughs) I think you were the one that showed me the post. And I'm like, what? What happened here? I did. (laughs) I I remember waking up that morning. I was like, did you know that Avery got married? I'm like, what? I mean, we knew he was going to, but we didn't know when. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So thanks for letting me know. Um, IRL. (laughs) So now... (laughs) I'm going to have another nacho grandbaby. I know. Man, they're spitting them out like crazy. So we'll have three. What? Three, three under two? Uh, well, the oldest will be, will be two, probably. So what's ironic is Avery's was born November 2021. Ethan's was born November 2022. Branson's should be November, December, from my understanding, not sure yet, of 2023. Wow. How cool is that? So so now I know around this time next year. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make a prediction. Jackson will be next. No. <laughs> <laughs> next will be Avery and Kay again. Really? Yeah. Now, you're not talking about like next year. You just mean next. November 2024. Really? That's just what I'm thinking. Mm. It's time to cycle back around. Mm. Yep. All right. Well, they got a lot of life changes coming up with him getting out of the military, so we'll see. That's going to be interesting because David's oldest is getting out of the military this year. Next year, Branson is getting out of the military. Mm-hmm. So, got some boomeranging happening. Mm-hmm. That can boomerang, boomerang back to them mama's house. <laughs> <laughs> I kid, I kid. Okay. So, other than that, that's all I got to say today. So happy Memorial Day, people. Yeah, we appreciate those folks who have given their life uh, and the ultimate sacrifice to keep our country free here in the United States. Yes. Thank you. All right. Peace out, folks. Remember, life is good. When you nacho. Or when your wife listens. When your husband listens. (laughs) When your kids listen. When your kids kids communicate. (laughs) The end. Listening to this episode of the Nacho Kids Podcast. Find us online at nachokids.com. 
Until next time, remember, life is good when you nacho.